like to welcome all the participants and the speakers to this really exciting panel that we are going to have on housing innovations, a pathway for achieving climate sustainability. So as we are all very aware that uh, today we are faced with an unprecedented global housing challenge, which is further exacerbated by unprecedented climate change. Now, climate change, as we know, impacts everyone, uh, whichever country one is living in, or whether you're high income or low income, but the more vulnerable and the extremely poor are the ones who uh, face the brunt of the climate change. And these are also, unfortunately, the people who do not have proper access to housing. The housing sector impacts climate change and is also impacted upon by climate change. So this is an important sector to look at because it has an impact on climate change and is further exasperating the impact and also gets impacted upon by the climate change. So in order to mitigate climate change and to also adapt to climate change, the housing sector presents a huge potential and also room for innovations and solutions to tackle climate change and address the need for providing housing to the vulnerable and the extreme poor. So the session today aims to bring together different perspectives and also insights on the relationship between climate change and housing, the need to address housing issues in a climate friendly manner, and the role of housing innovations in mitigating climate concerns. We'll also be hearing some very interesting case studies today and also looking to better understand what are the climate concerns in the housing sector? What is currently being done by organizations to address the climate concerns in the housing sector? And we'll also get some clarity on what are the roles of the different actors and stakeholders in the housing sector and highlight how the innovative approaches in the housing sector can be used and are being developed to address climate change issues. Um, a few logistical announcements before we go into the session and before we go into the keynote is um, there is a chat box which everyone can access. And so please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. And if you have any questions for the panelists at any given time of the presentation, we would just request you to kindly pose your question along with your name and organization in the chat box. And the speakers will be addressing your questions in the Q&A session towards the end of the session. Now this session today is being recorded and it is also going to be available online uh, in a couple of weeks time on YouTube and some other uh, links which will be then uh, provided to you by the uh, summit organizers. And um, I would like to introduce myself too briefly. My name is Pooja Sahani. I am the moderator of the session today. And I uh, work as an associate director for People Public Private Partnership with the Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, next slide, please, Rutuja. Rutuja, sorry, can I have the next slide, please? So just very quickly going over the agenda, we will have a keynote speak by Mr. Luis Noda. I will introduce him to you briefly, which will be followed by a panel discussion. Uh, we have four esteemed panelists with us today, and this will be followed by a Q&A session and a wrap-up session. So next, please. So I've introduced myself already. Uh, you can see uh, my name and my details here and more details about myself as well as the keynote speaker and the panelists. You can uh, kindly see your chat box and you will have the details uh, there. So with this now, I would like to move on and introduce you to our keynote speaker, Mr. Luis Noda who is the Vice President Asia Pacific for Habitat for Humanity International. And as I just mentioned, if you would like to know more about Louise, I uh, request you to kindly check your chat box for details. But very briefly, Louise has extensive experience in nonprofit management and he's, um, he's had several leadership roles uh, at the Food for the Hunger 
And as I said, currently he's working with us at the Habitat for Humanity. He has more than 27 years of experience in international relief and development that started in his birth country, which is Bolivia. So there's very interesting information about Luis in the chat box. So mm -hmm. I would request you to kindly check his details there. Uh, with this, I would now like to invite uh, Luis to kindly uh, make your keynote speech. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Luis, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pooja. I hope that you can hear me okay. Yes, uh, we can hear you. Thank you for the confirmation. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody and uh, good afternoon to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me a great pleasure to be joining you for this session on housing innovations and climate change. The Sankalp Global Summit has gone viral and virtual due to the pandemic, but I am thrilled to connect with you from Metro Manila in the Philippines. Uh, it's early even in my time. Um, and you know, this year is the second time that Habitat for Humanity has participated in the Sankalp Summit we hope to build on the partnership by contributing to an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, investors, corporations, multilateral and policymakers who want to help achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals through entrepreneurship and innovation. I especially want to acknowledge our panelists, our distinguished panelists that are with us today. Uh, I look forward to hearing their insights and perspectives on the discussion that we will have with them. And as you have heard from Pooja, the need for adequate housing solutions is immense uh, in Asia and the Pacific, especially when the world is facing a global housing deficit. And emphasize now with the global pandemic that we are going through and with the challenges that we are facing with climate. According to the United Nations, half of the world's population uh, sorry, half of the world's poor live in Asia Pacific as the region, and they live with less than $1.9 per day, which is the extreme poverty line. And this is severely limiting their access to affordable and decent housing. And you and I know that there's also research being done and there's evidence as well that the current global pandemic is increasing even further the challenge of extreme poverty in, in, in many countries and around the world. With the Asia Pacific region facing a record number of climate related disasters in 2020, tens of millions of people who have already badly affected by the pandemic will be worse off. The people hit hardest are usually those who live in poor quality housing and marginal uh, land. And you know, I was shocked when I read from the Red Cross uh, in a report last year that the world uh, is failing to protect communities that are most exposed and vulnerable to climate risks. A report recently released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, a UN agency, warns of a human-induced climate catastrophe and unprecedented proportions, especially in India, which faces extreme climate change patterns and the increased occurrence of natural disasters in a developing country like India. Natural disasters affect human and physical capital, as well as they have the potential of halting the economic progress. By partnering with families to build stronger, more disaster resilient and more energy efficient uh, housing, we have seen how adequate, safe, and resilient shelter can contribute to both the immediate secure security and the long-term well-being of families while reducing a home's environmental impact. And let me give you one example. We can go to the next slide. You will see a family there. Warda in Maharashtra is known to witness extreme weather conditions. One such family affected by is Manohar and Pushpa Shendre. Manohar worked as an agricultural laborer in a nearby farm. Every year, the family had to leave their old home to a safe space during the monsoon. The family lost their belongings almost every year due to the flooding. To add to the misery, the family lost their home in a dam building project 
the lower Warda Dam that was built up over there by the Warda River. Manohar had no money to build up a new home in the land allocated to him. Habitat for Humanity partnered with Ma Manohar and 25 such families affected by this project to build homes for these families. Habitat, Habitat made us uh, made use of the proto, uh, sorry, fourth term play break. And this is to build homes for families in Guarda region. As a standard construction material like reinforced cement concrete don't provide insulation for the extreme climate conditions in the region. These bricks are 60% less in weight than the conventional walling material and high, high uh, compre com compre uh, compressive sorry, strength. The bricks provided excellent thermal and sound insulation. This helps the families with extreme conditions that they face every year. Due to the added insulation, there is a decrease in the energy consumption as well in the house. The bricks are natural and green. The clay used in the production is sourced from the stilling of dead water tanks and only natural additives like coal ash, rice husk, and sawdust are used, thus minimizing the carbon footprint. The housing sector has the potential to impact and, the, and, and be impacted by the climate change, as you all know. Gradual changes in various climate attributes and possible changes in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events will progressively affect operation over time. And what kind of combination can help in combating the issues of climate change? It also helps in achieving the various SDGs, the, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly SDG number 11, which is make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, and SDG number 12, that it's related to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. The construction sector is one of the largest contributors to environmental pollution, and we know that. And plant building of homes, leads to the disruption of natural habitat, depletion of natural resources, production of construction materials leads to pollution on air, water, diverts lands, and this, this disrupts the, the ecological cycle. The United Nations Environment Program has found that buildings in their construction produce nearly 40% of global energy related greenhouse gas emissions. Increased in urban migration and controlled population ex explosion and advancement in development, like the construction of roadways, airports, leads to increasing the demand of already depleting natural resources. Emerging innovations in housing helps in mitigating and adapting to climate change through incorporating new technologies and focusing on new housing designs based on the environmental factors that we're considering. At Habitat for Humanity, we live into the idea of getting innovation to permeate the affordable housing sector and the construction industry. Through Habitat's Terwilliger Center for Innovation in Shelter, we have been promoting and in incubating various startups and small businesses which focus on making the homes more energy efficient, reducing waste generated during the construction and even the reuse of waste and the recycling. While we hear from two inspiring businesses owners today in the panel, together with the panel representing Eco STP and Excel Coating, uh, it's going to be inspiring to hear them what they have to share with us. But for this moment, I would like to focus on two examples. One is related to mod roof. Mod roof, mod roof is a modular roofing system for slums and village uh, homes, schools, hospitals, and other constructions. The main component of the roof system is, a, is panels that are custom manufactured from packaging and agricultural waste. To address the challenges of operating in the, in the developing world, re-materials design, the roofing system 
to be modular, allowing easy shipment installation and replacement of individual panels. Modroof is aesthetically appealing with a fresh and colorful appearance, as you can see in the pictures over there. The Modroof panels are strong, are durable, fireproof, and long lasting. It is low cost and easy to install. The roofing panels are created through materials which has 90% recyclability at the end of the lifespan. The panels have high reflective index as well, which reduces the absorbent capacity of the roof, making the house cooler during the summers. The other thing that I want to refer to is about the Innocentive Challenge. Habitat for Humanity through the Terry Werliger Center for Innovation and Shelter with Seafried Labs initiated a global crowdsourcing challenge in October 2020. Through the Innocenti platform, we sought groundbreaking ideas to improve housing quality in communities around the world. The Asia Pacific region is home to two of the four global challenges. One for the Philippines and the other for India. A civil engineering team from the University of the Philippines won the competition for retrofitting houses with unsafe foundations to be resilient to a magnitude of 6.5 earthquake and a typhoon with more than 200 kilometers per hour winds. Solvers were challenged to address the construction and demolition waste in India. And the winning team provided design inputs for affordable machinery that separates, makes waste for reuse and recycling. And that's very, very exciting. As a global housing provider, we have a responsibility to use our voice to raise awareness of emerging housing issues and the important role that housing can play in mitigating the impact of climate change. To support systemic change, we work with stakeholders throughout the housing ecosystem, including governments, academia, civil society groups, multilateral agencies, and private sector, construction companies, housing entrepreneurs and material providers, so that the needs of the communities we work with are acknowledged and at the same time addressed. This also leads us to more responsive and inclusive markets that allow families to better weather and more quickly recover from disasters and other shocks. Habitat for Humanity is aware that we cannot possibly meet the tremendous housing needs on our own. Complex housing issues call for collaborative and innovative approaches. Habitat for Humanity, therefore, is calling on stakeholders to incorporate adequate and affordable housing into future planning for climate change in two ways. By being sure that to put the people which is the most important part of any formula that we can play for development at the center. And the other thing is the climate that we need to put as well as the center. First, to ensure mitigation efforts in the built environment and housing sector do not drive up costs and further expand the global deficit of adequate and affordable housing. And second, to ensure adaptation that protects communities and natural habitats is inclusive in the needs of the most vulnerable. Adaptation in housing is integral in preparing communities for rising sea levels, droughts, flood, heat waves, and increasing intensity of weather events. Without adequate and affordable housing that is adaptive, communities' resilience cannot be accomplished, strengthened, and realized. My hope is that ensuring discussions in decision on housing and climate sustainability will articulate the potential impacts of housing innovation to mitigate climate concerns and address housing needs in a climate sensitive way. Thank you very much for joining us in this session. And with that being said, I would like to pass it back to Pooja. Thank you. Thank you very much.
encourage new ideas and innovations that we have so thank you very much once again louis uh, for your for your keynote speech now before we move on to the panel discussion and to hear from our esteemed panelists we would also like to hear from the participants a little bit about which organizations you represent so we are now going to put up a poll an online poll which will be visible to you. It will take you just about a second. Um, so request you to kindly check the chat box and it will have the link to the poll to let us know uh, which organization you represent. And uh, we are starting the poll now and you have about 30 seconds for the poll. So please, I would encourage all of you to kindly click on the poll. Thank you. We'll put the results up for everyone to see. My colleagues are also keeping an eye out on the time that we have for the poll. You still have a couple of seconds left. I think time is almost up. We're going to be closing the poll now. Can we have the results up, please, if possible? I'm just sharing them. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. So we have um, a large number who come from the ecosystem supporters and we have entrepreneurs, which is very good to see. And then we have a few others who have put in others, but if you would, we would like to also know a little bit more about who the others are. So kindly use the chat box anytime during the panel to also let us know a little bit more about you, where you come from and what your designation is. We will we'll like to, we we'll like to share and see that. Okay. So, Stop sharing the screen and then now move on to our panel. And I would like to take this opportunity now. Uh, can we have the next slide, please, Rutuja? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our esteemed panelists. We have some very interesting learnings and lessons to take away from our panelists today. We have four panelists. Uh, we and I will be introducing them as and when they are going to be speaking. Uh, so I'm going to open the panel now and request Mr. Ajay Suri, who is the Senior Advisor of Inclusive Development at the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Um, Ajay is a seasoned expert on uh, urban issues and he's worked with various organizations, uh, including the UN and worked across Asia. So if you are interested in knowing more about Ajay, please do have a look at your chat box. So Ajay, welcome, and the floor is all yours, please. Thanks so much, Pooja. Thanks for the kind introduction. 
and thanks also to the organizers for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. I completely uh, agree with Louis, uh, all the points that he raised in his presentation of keynote address, uh, bringing, uh, highlighting the climate challenges, highlighting the issue of a housing shortage and the need to balance uh, climate considerations with improvement in housing for the low income uh, uh, residents of the cities. To my mind, climate cha challenges are real and can no longer be labeled as rhetoric of the scientists and the doomsayers. Each one of us is a witness to unprecedented spikes in the weather, both in terms of precipitation and temperatures. Extremes in hot and cold weather conditions are not uncommon, nor the long periods of drought interspersed with sudden spikes in uh, precipitation level. Housing shortage is also a challenge in the developing world with significant proportion of the city population either living in dilapidated houses, devoid of access to urban services or having suboptimal per capita living space or both. The extremely hot weather also creates heat islands which has high impact on the urban poor, most of whom work in the informal sector. Think of the street vendors, construction workers, or even the own account enterprises, manufacturing units operating from their homes. It is true uh, that construction is one of the major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, but let us not forget, it is also the largest contributor to the national economy and employment. The challenge is to address housing shortages in a manner which is environmentally sustainable. The key question is how? In my view, there is the need to move the construction sector from linear to circular systems. A linear economy refers to the use, use it up and throw it away models. The concept of circular economy emphasizes that waste and pollution can be designed out and products and materials can be used for longer, thus facilitating natural systems to regenerate. The circular economy strives to remove waste in the ecosystem. In this concept, waste does not refer to the usual reference to the junk. It indicates underutilization of resources or assets. The construction sector, for example, could use building materials based on recycled products. Louis gave the example of orothermal uh, bricks. There's another example very much evident in India whereby fly ash from thermal power plants can be used for building blocks and steel and wood, which are scavenged or recycled from unserviceable dilapidated, dilapidated buildings can be reused. But more importantly, the housing shortages may be addressed in an environmentally sustainable manner by repurposing old buildings, thereby ensuring optimal use of the existing stock and reducing the need for demolition of old buildings for construction of new ones. The world is urbanizing fast and the growth in urban population is generating huge demand for additional built up spaces for all uses, residential, commercial and industrial. In India, there was a study a few years back on the housing shortage, uh, which ran up to something in the, in the cities, in the urban areas. And the housing shortage was estimated around 20 million units. And this housing shortage was predominantly in the low income segment. The need for more new buildings can be reduced by repairing and renovating older ones by adopting a circular approach. The construction sector needs to find a robust solution to design, design out waste, keep materials in use with a high value for longer time, integrate nature-based solutions for heating, cook, cooling, and treating waste, and to regen, help regenerate the natural systems. In a nutshell, the construction industry will need to, uh, will need to plan a built environment that is safe, livable, cost-effective, and will contribute to achieving climate targets. Uh, let me end this small talk by stating that instead of demolishing old buildings, creative ways of retrofitting, renovating, refurbishing, 
old buildings will not only offer opportunities for cost effective less resource intensive and lower emission solutions it will at the same time create green job opportunities uh, as louis had highlighted in his keynote address covid 19 has impacted the low income segments in various ways uh, across the countries across the globe most of the low income population works in the informal settlement uh, informal sector and covid has impacted them and the use of the circular approach will help will help to generate jobs create jobs uh, which use local skills to a large extent circular renovation and renewal projects will thus extend attractive opportunities for boosting local economy through employment of local professionals and skilled workers this will this will also give a boost to the affordable housing sector thanks very much pooja this is what i needed to state in a very very short duration thanks yeah thank you very much ajay for a very interesting uh, presentation and for highlighting the need to move from a linear to a circular mode i mean circular economy circular way is really the way to go which is highlighted by sdg 12 so when we are usually talking about sdg 11 we to talk about sdg 12 together and also for highlighting really especially in the urban areas for instead of demolishing the buildings to actually retrofit them which is a more environmentally friendly way and also has the potential of creating a uh, green jobs so thank you once again for your very interesting presentation thank you uh, i would now like to invite our next esteemed panelist uh, mrs vaishali nandan uh, vaishali has uh, more than 24 years of experience in issues related to urban planning climate change and waste management she is part of many expert groups and has exhaustive experience across the country on working on these issues Um, more information about uh, vaishali can be found in the chat box so for all the panelists their brief bio has been uploaded so i would request you to kindly have a look at that and now may i invite uh, vaishali uh, to please uh, make your presentation the floor is all yours thank you very much thank you so much pooja and uh, thank you uh, to the organizers uh, to habitat for humanity and of course sankal uh, for hosting the session um i think i would also really agree with not only what louis said but also what uh, ajay said before me and uh, some of the experiments that we have done in our project is what i would like to share with you uh, next please yeah. so uh, next please so um i'm heading uh, the climate smart cities project of gz gz is the uh, technical arm of the government of germany uh, part of the development cooperation working in 120 countries um and india is one of them where there is a bilateral cooperation project uh, which which i'm heading uh, um the project is implemented uh, on behalf of the um ministry of environment government of germany uh, as part of the international climate initiative jointly with the ministry of housing and urban affairs um we are working in uh, three cities uh, bhubaneswar coimbatore and kochi across different subjects and uh, the idea being to anchor climate friendly solutions in uh, urban infrastructure um, through planning and implementation in smart cities um uh, our main partners is is the other municipal corporations and uh, what we are working on the ground is really on different subjects and uh, i come from another angle uh, where we are working of course in the city of kochi on green buildings but also in uh, waste management construction demolition waste management solid waste management urban planning um, storm water management and green cover and like it or not uh, everything has an implication on each other and if you really look at it it's all an ecosystem and that's where the city functions and housing of course is one of the biggest components there next please 
So, um, to add to what Ajay said before me, um, um, house, you know, construction demolition waste coming from the housing sector or from the from the various kinds of constructions that is there is uh, is a real problem when it comes to the city and uh, much of what happens really on the ground at least in indian cities but i'm sure also you know worldwide uh, is is the dumping uh, that happens in water bodies uh, looking at you know various kinds of hazardous material that is uh, dumped either close to water bodies or in water bodies uh, looking at encroaching land which is one of the you know biggest biggest issues there so, um, um, but on the other hand, uh, there is a huge, huge economy where uh, the utilization already happens. In the informal sector, we actually went down on the ground in two of our cities, Bhuvneshwar and Coimbatore, looking for the kind of waste that was, uh, you know, really, really leaching, reaching the, the dump site. And, and you would not believe we did not really find... Uh, the, the critical material, apart from, you know, some, some cement um, that, was, that could not really be recovered. So if you were really looking at, uh, you know, um, the housing, um, at least the individual houses, which were, you know, um, really brought down, uh, there was very little that was going out. But of course, even that was still going out. Um, so what Coimbatore has done, they they use that material as a cover over the landfill. But I would say that is really the last thing that should be used for this construction and demolition waste. There is so much, and and there are studies which claim that up to you know ninety five percent can be reutilized. It's only the five percent that needs to be you know um, really actually uh, be looked at when it comes to disposal. Um, landfill, of course, being the last of the resorts. There are various various systems for construction and devolution waste management. It's now also there in the rules, and you know, uh, the new SBM 2.0 also says that each city really needs to look at the management of it. But the core, you know, core area where it's actually coming from is the housing uh, sector and the commercial. And so, so not only the residential, but also the institutional and the commercial buildings, which are actually the generators. Uh, next, please. So moving on to another subject that we also then, you know, worked in the project is um, green buildings that I was talking about in Kochi. And uh, interestingly, we did a, a climate action plan for Kochi. And if you see the graph on the right side, the two, two constant, almost constant, you know, uh, sections, uh, the, the blue one below is, is the residential buildings and the one above that is the commercial and institutional buildings, which form a large chunk of the GAG emissions in the city. And this is a common, you know, thing when it comes to any city. And uh, on the other side, we also, you know, were trying to find out how many, uh, you know, um, um, architects or uh, builders really know about how to actually put those green building aspects in in um, in the you know uh, in their own buildings. How to really actually incorporate it? Where we then tried to develop a checklist, and of course, what you see in the middle is still still work in progress. Where we are looking at the Kochi Municipal Corporation building and trying to retrofit it. So it's already an existing building where we are trying to say that, yeah, it's an existing building. What all can we do to actually put in the maximum things that you know, um, can really be, um, uh, uh, let's say, recommended so that it, the maximum easiest adaptations that any existing building could do to really make it into a green building. But that's you know, where the crux of the issue lies, I would say. Uh, most of India is already built. There are very few cities and very few areas that come up as green, you know, um, that are totally built new. Yeah, which means that it's, it's existing commercial or institutional or residential buildings, which we are actually looking at making green. And if those are the things that we are really looking at, then it's, it's a huge innovation that, that the housing sector really needs to put, you know, put together. Uh, the other is the gap that is really there is in the residential part. 
residential, which is usually done by individual households. Um, we are still struggling on how to, you know, really, really hit the nail where each and every householder says, yes, I need to make my, you know, building most, most efficient. Uh, so it, it also means that there's a huge awareness generation that needs to be done. And maybe Habitat for Humanity should really take that as a drive where, you know, you can actually educate uh, not only the builders, not only the contractors, but also each and every resident to say, okay, this is exactly what I need when it comes to making a green building. It has to become a movement. If it does not, we will draw really, you know, um, with the current climate change aspect, really lose the battle, I would say. Uh, next, please. Um, one very interesting thing that the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs has done, JZ was very instrumental. And then, of course, there were 26 of organizations, NIUA was uh, also a big part there. And now NIUA is taking this forward is the Climate Smart Cities Assessment Framework. Um, it has uh, uh, five sectors, five, I would say it's actually 13 sectors covering across 13 indicators, 30, 28 indicators, I'm sorry. And uh, two of the indicators talk about promoting green buildings and green building adoption, yeah. And, um, and we we had this uh, assessment framework which was which assessed initially 100 cities and then all the 100 smart cities and then it went on to assess 128 uh, smart cities plus 1 million cities and we really found out that this area of green buildings and and green building adoption is really lacking in on the ground when it really comes to implementation and um, not more than 20 to 25% of the buildings in any city could be said to have, you know, um, to have any kind of, you know, systems in place. And uh, maybe, you know, it's it's not on also that much. It was also, you know, simply saying was ECBC mandated, was, was uh, uh, the NBC uh, rules compliant, were the buildings NBC compliant. And there is a huge lacuna. So, so this is something that I would really, you know, um, ask you all to look at this as one of the areas for innovation. There's a huge gap, and it's it's a it's a documented proof for that. But with that, I would say um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, next, please. I think I come to the end of my presentation, and. Uh, um, I would really urge all of you in the audience, but all the organizers as well, to really look at this, you know, um, uh, innovation as, as one of the sectors. Use urban design thinking methodology, use various kinds of methodologies that we also tried to experiment with. And it's something that, you know, will really bear fruit in the long run. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Vaishali, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, point noted, I think we all realize, um, you know, it's very important, of course, to look at climate change, but also to look at housing and all the, you know, the all that is being done in the field already. Um, Habitat for Humanity is doing a lot of work, but of course, there's always a need for creation of more awareness, um, more innovations. And that's precisely what um, Habitat for Humanity has been doing uh, over the last couple of decades. So we've noted that well, um, and we'll keep it in mind. And I think to address some of the uh, questions or rather concerns that you've raised, the next two panelists, in fact, uh, are examples from the field um, of how you know certain aspects of housing and at the same time climate change are being tackled. So the next two panelists really have very interesting um, case studies to present on their work. And um, with this, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Tarun Kumar, who is the co-founder and the CEO of EcoSTP Technologies Private Limited. And Tarun has got more than 20 years of experience in the field of IT and sustainability and has done a lot of work on coming up with sustainable solutions, especially in the sewage management system, which is a problem that we are all facing in big cities, especially. And uh, once again, for more information about Tarun, kindly check your chat box. 
And with this, I would like to hand the floor to Tarun. So welcome, Tarun. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Hello, all. Thanks, Pooja. And that's, thanks for the inter introduction. And we heard from um, esteemed speakers on the larger issues, right, they're facing us. So today I'm going to speak a little more tactical something, see what you can do on the ground. So a couple of examples on, on the sewage treatment uh, to start with, right? So that's a, a big issue and we're trying to solve that in a small way. So we are a four-year-old startup uh, trying to make a difference in the sewage mess we are in, uh, in fact, the real mess we are in. So we're trying to solve it. Can you um, move the next slide, please? Right, let's start with the, as usual, the start of the problem. Uh, the problem is, as you know, I don't have to explain. Uh, it's a big issue. Uh, the minister says 70% of the sea treatment plants in India is broken. Uh, in fact, it is uh, 80 to 90%, uh, our estimate. It's that bad. Uh, so it's it's broken for multiple reasons. But uh, when, it, when it breaks, it, the entire sewage flows all over the place, right? It, it creates all the... Um, all the issues, right? Now uh, we find in the groundwater get polluted by E. coli when we did the recent test results, right? So it's so surprising. How can it, groundwater is way, way low? The bacteria cannot uh, reach to the ground, uh, crossing through the bad zone, but somehow it's become that bad. There's so much uh, thing going. So groundwaters are getting polluted, and groundwater is the only source we have uh, seriously in our country. Then uh, cities like Chennai and Bombay are lucky, uh, all the sewage goes to sea. So we are okay. Um, Cities like Bangalore are in bigger trouble. And like, for example, the, um, the lake which I live nearby gets 400 million liters per, per day of waste. 400 million liters every single day. Keeps a committee. Come on in. And that's one who catches fire once in a while. So that's an issue um, we are in. So the point, key point here is, uh, it's a known issue, right? Why nobody's doing anything about it? Uh, and uh, when we, as a startup, looked into this, we found there are two big issues why the system is like this. Uh, number one, STPs needs lots of power. I mean, lots means lots. Uh, so you can't run STPs with solar power. You need really, we're talking about uh, for, for a housing unit, 30 HP, 40 HP, motors running 20 hours per day kind of. So it's a lot of power required. So, so India doesn't have power, simple. We don't, we, in fact, we have power only for a couple of weeks to run our existing system. So if you want to treat our entire waste, we simply don't have power. Now, assuming you have power, assuming we have a, um, some nuclear facility with lots of power coming in, Right. Then comes the second problem. That is the, the tech is broken. The technology, the current STP technology today is broken. Uh, the technology which used 99.9% .9 all over India, all over the world, in fact, is is broken, uh, is completely broken. Um, let me explain this. I know it's a very uh, big statement I'm making. Right. So what happens is uh, the we have smartphones, we have lots of technology, we have people go to space and come back, but sewage treatment is still a good old technique, wherein is there started for 40 years, 50 years back, that is blow air through fecal matter and uh, it works. And so you put a aerobic bacteria, you blow air through fecal matter and then that's it. So any tech you take, uh, we have MBR, SBR, anything is all blow air through fecal matter and that's it. And you have lots of uh, research going on, trillions of dollars in uh, money going in, improving how do you blow air through fecal matter better and how do you do the sieving better, how do you do a better filter, but no one is really treating it, right? It's just a, the old, good old uh, mouse trap. How do you improve it better and better? That's what everyone is focusing on. Right? So that's what the uh, issue is. And STPs, once is all working well, it needs lots of maintenance. Right? It's a very complex machinery. It is not the job of a, a housing society to run it. It's actually a job of government to run it because it needs a complex machinery. So one is a power. Now, assuming you have power, it's a very complicated machine. You need lots of power, a lot of chemicals, a lot of um, uh, maintenance, um, cleaning. Uh, it works well if you maintain it well. So these are the two issues which we we found uh, as an issue. So we asked uh, a, a fundamental question, how does nature treat it, right? How did nature treat all the years? I mean, how does, we didn't never had motors to blow out through fecal matter. That should be a somewhat simpler way, right? So so that's where we came to the, can you move to the next slide, please? We came to our innovation, that's called EcoSTP. It's a good old uh, um, technique, we improved, improved, improved. So what we found is nature uh, breaks down the waste. Nature breaks down everything, right? From the the biggest components breaks it down, breaks it down, breaks it down, the smallest component. And it's done using uh, a, a multiple of, you know, the, and bacteria, the fungi, the, uh, specifically anaerobic bacteria is what does a breakdown, anaerobic bacteria. So we, we found that in septic tank. So a septic tank is a great example of anaerobic bacteria thing, but it's not very efficient. It doesn't treat well, but it, it works well. There are many systems who works on anaerobic bacteria concept. 
what we found is the cow stomach is much efficient way of breaking down the whatever cow eats gets bro broken down uh, in and the and this very powerful efficient anaerobic digestion mission is a cow stomach is in so we learned from the cow stomach we got a lot of lots of global support right we um, for example uh, biomimicry institute montana us uh, we have been there a few times there lots of technical mentoring from them uh, royal engineering academy lots of engineering support from them we have uh, shelter tech accelerator helping us on the business side so lots of brigade helping us out from the real estate side so lots of help globally because we are trying to solve a big issue big issue and so we are trying to we have a huge purpose so we have lots of people across the world supporting how do you improve the existing systems right good old septic tank system how do you improve the septic tank system to treat to the today's uh, requirements that is specifically called bod 10 and cod 50 that's the two terminologies which we mark on how do you achieve that level of purity naturally without using power or chemicals so this is what we we, we came out with so three stages stage one two three four and the fourth stage I'll explain in a minute. So all your fecal matter, everything lands in stage one, it moves to stage two by gravity and the water flows in a, in a linear manner. And then the stage three, again, the water gets filtered and then your clean water comes out. I'm not going to technical complexity, but you put bad water in, you put good water out, clear water, visually clear water. We, in fact, we have an Instagram picture with pictures of the water that comes out. So the third stage water can be further filtered using a Midland and the slow sand filter, very old technique again, very old technique. We just took the old technique, repurposed it for today's housing and challenges and space, uh, space because nowadays in urban, there's no space. Uh, some of the old techniques works with have lots of space. So we try to compress it. Uh, how do you make it biophilic? How do you make it along with the housing unit? How do you build the STP around it? So these are the innovations we did. And then we got it done. So stage one, two, three, bad water in, and you get good water out. Can move next slide, please? So I go show you some couple of examples. So that's more visual. Right? So this is one. Uh, in fact, this uh, uh, this is a site in Bangalore. Morning, I was here with uh, a team from various Dr. Said and all came down to see. So morning, I was there. Three and a half years, they not touch this STP. So what you see is the underground is STP, uh, all those things, and it's bioflick. It, it, when building was constructed, STP is made. Water is used by, uh, for for the plants. We see is the is a stage four, the wetlands. The water used for recycle for flushing and car wash and then the clean the flows. So water is recycled back. And the little water extra is been used for gardening. So all the water contains there, right? Nothing goes out, clear water, the conformity to all the norms. Uh, as I said, BOD 10, COD 50 quality water. Underground system, three and a half years, I was in the morning, um, along with some uh, Dr. Said and team, not touched, right? So not even, not maintained, nothing. It just, it just works naturally. Uh, it's be called a miracle, right? So three and a half years. Imagine as normal sewage treatment plant, if you don't operate for three hours, because you need to have a motor running for 20 hours, right? Forget, forget about three days, three hours, you, you, the operator is away, the whole thing crashes, but this is how it works beautifully three and a half years. And I can move to the next slide, please. This is another ex example I have to showcase. This is another example. Um, it's a children's playground, what you see below that is an STP. It's a housing unit. Um, it's like a very, uh, um, it's not, it's not at a high-end uh, uh, housing unit. It's a very low-end housing unit, no space, uh, jam-packed, uh, uh, no area. So only a place available was the children's park, a small one. Like we put it below that. And the only maintenance is once in two years, you remove the little bit of sand and remove the sludge, that's a fertilizer. Once in two years, that's it. And stage one, two, three is underground. And what you see in the, in the right side is the plants, uh, the, that's the wetland. And water gets uh, filtered, and there's a tank, and they do the disinfection because if you want to reduce the water as the law, you have to disinfect it. So it add a chlorine or ozone. So they put ozone and use the water for flushing. Again, completely self-contained, not touched at all, right? We're working beautifully well. So this is what we're trying to um, encourage more and more buildings instead of making STP far away, a motor based unit, bring it closer, decentralized. A polluter base, right? They are the polluter. Right? Let them treat the water and use the water. Why throw it up, throw the water away? make it closer, run it, make it holistic, make it part of the systems instead of make it a, an add-on system, and et cetera. And uh, yeah, this is what the uh, one example uh, I have. But three, four slides will explain more. And I can talk more later. Thank you, Fuja. And that's just my last slide. Yeah, thank you so much, really, for this very interesting presentation. Tharun. I When I first heard about it, I, it was difficult for me to imagine how this actually happened. And then I checked out YouTube and the very interesting video that you have there. And this really helps tackle two problems. Of course, sewage is, um, you know, a very real problem that we face. 
across the board, uh, but more so in, in the urban areas. And also how it's a climate friendly solution, as you said, you know, no chemicals are used. So this is really a, a technology, a very innovative way really to tackle multiple problems at the same time. So thank you very much for sharing this wonderful example with us. And I would now like to move on to our last uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Vidya Prakash, who is the proprietor of Excel Coatings. He has a very interesting background, so I would encourage you to have a look at his uh, bio in the chat. But the one thing that stood out for me was, um, you know, he's been inspired by the work that his, uh, his father has done. And he decided that he was not cut out for a nine to five job. So he headed out on his own. So I will um, like to invite uh, Mr. Vidya Prakash now to share with us a really, uh, uh, innovative example of how uh, he's dealing with the issue of controlling temperature, uh, you know, with the climate change and its impact, the temperatures are rising, we are all aware of it, but the product that he's working on really helps in having a cooling impact. So I will now like to invite Mr. Vidhi Prakash, so the floor is all yours, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Hi, I'm Vidya Prakash uh, from Excel Coatings. Uh, so here we are, I'm here to address the small uh, solution, which is an effective solution uh, that uh, would help uh, reduce uh, global warming uh, to a little extent at least. Uh, so normally now due to the growing population, the need for housing is getting uh, very intense. And uh, when the housing and uh, population increases, the need for electricity and uh, urbanization increases. So once the urbanization increases, or in, uh, urbanization, industrialization, and uh, unsustainable lifestyle, uh, we are facing a, a huge climate change and the increase in temperature every year. So which is uh, really a big concern and uh, it makes life uh, very difficult. And mainly for the low income sectors and uh, people who are, are uh, who cannot afford an AC, or even when you afford an AC, you uh, you contribute to CO2 emissions. So these are uh, regular problems uh, we are facing. Uh, next slide, slide, please. So normally now, uh, due to this urbanization, you see that uh, the, there is an increase in temperature, there is an increase, um, there is a differentiation of the weather, there's no proper rainfalls or uh, too much of rainfalls and floodings. So these, these are the main uh, problems uh, that we are facing in the current uh, generation. And this increase in heat and cold is uh, really a cause and which makes life uh, very difficult. Uh, so what happens in, in this urbanization is that, that you see that the city temperatures are usually two to two and a half degrees higher when compared to the suburbs. These are because uh, the uh, due to the car building materials, which absorbs a lot of solar energy and it radiates it even until the midnight. So even the sun goes down by 6, 6.30, still you, the heat that is absorbed by the buildings are being radiated into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, so which which keeps the atmosphere temperature higher and uh, which in, in turn you will have to run your ACs or uh, you have to run your cooling systems even until midnight in the concrete buildings. Uh, so normally once the temperature increases, what happens people uh, now go, um, people go searching for a solution. Next slide, please. So normally what happens is once you start, when to reduce this uh, problem of heat and cold, so people choose different solutions like uh, they go for air conditions, which is a very, very uh, easy solution. So just go buy it, plug it, and play it. So you get your uh, temperatures down. But what is the impact you make on the uh, world? Uh, the, there is a very high impact. I mean, due to too much uh, usage of air conditioners, you know, the CO2, the CO2 uh, carbon footprints are getting higher and uh, they go for uh, water sprinkling on the roofs. Uh, so which uh, is again a scarce resource. We are wasting water. Now we, are, we have a scarcity of water. And some uh, countries like Gulf, they go for cavity walls. That is a double wall. Uh, so it again increases the uh, uh, requirement for building materials. So which in turn then over a period of time goes as a building waste again. Uh, so these are some uh, unsustainable uh, solutions which are happening. And once you go for all these, these require power. 
So you have an industrial cooler or an AC or a water sprinkler. You need motor to power it. And uh, you need height uh, for air conditioners. You need high amount of energy. So these are not uh, sustainable solutions, which in turn helps, and which in turn indu induces more the global warming. And uh, since the ACs, you know, the, the output of the ACs gives more heat. It again increases the overall environmental temperature. The building materials that we use are different colors and different materials it again re radiates. So the temperature keeps on rising. Next uh, slide, please. So what we came up with uh, is a very uh, affordable and uh, sustainable solution. So what happens normally when there is a heat problem, instead of going for an AC, we can go for the cool roof paints. So once these paints are coated over the building materials, it reflects the IR rays so that the building material itself does not get hot. So once your roof is not getting hot, the heat will not enter into the building. So a common problem we face is the summer nights when you switch on the fan, you feel that hot air blowing and the sultriness. So the next step you do is immediately switch on your ACs. So this consumes a lot of power and uh, it costs you a lot. Whereas this one is affordable solution, just you paint it and forget it for next five to seven years. So what happens is this, uh, once you paint it, the heat, the roof, since the roof does not get hot, no heat enters into the building. So this uh, nowadays, uh, the buildings are uh, different types uh, start emerging. Like now the glass buildings are much higher. So what we have uh, done is we have bought in a clear transparent uh, uh, heat reflector coating. So uh, normally if you have a glass, you go, go for a window film, which is uh, if you have to get your temperatures down, you have to go for a darker window film. So what once you go for a dark room, again the room uh, you have to light up your room so that again uh, comes up uh, I mean uh, builds up to your electricity. So this uh, coating what we have introduced is uh, one for the roof and one for the glass. The roof we gave we created the cool roof paint which is a, a reflective plus insulation solution. Whereas for the glass it's a more transparent solution. It is more lighter in shade. You'll feel hardly feel a difference between the coated and the uncoated glass. You'll feel the light coming inside, but uh, almost 80 to 85 percent of the IR will be cut off through the glass that when it passes through the gla coated glass. So once uh, there are the sun sunlight falls, that area doesn't get heated up. So your internal air conditioner requirement reduces, and your lighting also reduces since it gives a very good transparency. So these are uh, two solutions that uh, uh, that helps in reducing your power consumption, and it is an affordable solution, and it is uh, and it does not leave any waste or anything. So this uh, glass coatings gives you a life of more than fifteen years. So once it's a very thin nano coating, so once you coat it and it is scratch proof, uh, it, you know you can just use it as a regular glass. You don't have any maintenance, and even the roof coating is our best uh, and uh, water uh, proofing. So once uh, this waterproofing is also a major issue. Once you uh, once the UV degradation happens, your concrete or the building material starts weakening, and once the drains are there, you know, slight crack is there, the rain tends to water tends to enter inside, and it creates a major problem. So by using these cool roof coatings, you can reduce your. Uh, I mean, you can increase your building's life and reduce the power consumption. Mainly when you go to the low income housing sectors, the people cannot afford for air conditioners, uh, where we can use this type of uh, coatings, uh, which will be very much affordable for them. And uh, they can use it, like, uh, they can use it on uh, their regular roofs. It can be a DIY. They can just they don't need any technical uh, people to install it. So it is a very easy to use uh, solution. Uh, next slide, please. So when you use these uh, solutions, what happens? Your main, the main advantage is that your uh, thermal comfort increases and the power consumption reduces. The requirement for uh, water for cooling the I mean, buildings or the air conditioner for cooling the buildings reduces a lot. Uh, recently, like uh, Energy and uh, Environmental Energy Technology Division of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory has uh, conducted a, a trial in India, and they have uh, found out that the field results are equal and directly, and the direct energy reduction is there. And they have almost, uh, almost, uh, it's, uh, they've almost uh, found that almost 10 to 19 percent of energy can be saved. Uh, by using these uh, coatings in the uh, air conditioned areas. Whereas uh, when you use it for commercial or the housing, wherever, wherever you require thermal comfort, when this reduces a lot of energy saving and they've, uh, they've seen, they've uh, found out that if they, if, with an assumption of of around uh, one lakh square meter of uh, building roofs every every year keeps increasing. The they, they, there there would be a large requirement of energy and uh, which is uh, which. Which is uh, it led to the financial as well. 
so oh, they have found out that uh, almost like uh, 10 years in a row if you take with uh, this kind of increase in almost like there will be a power saving of up to 5 billion uh, rupees in indian conditions uh, pan india so that is a that is a huge uh, where we will be saving a huge amount of money as well as huge amount of uh, electricity which is uh, scarce resource now as well and uh, this will give you a, a affordable and an easy solution which will not affect the environment so that's it thank you thank very you. much for your presentation uh, mr vidya prakash it was really interesting and fascinating to see really all these innovations that are ongoing and the different solutions that we are working on to tackle the same issue which is on climate change as well as on the housing sector also so thank you very much for your presentation and uh, thank you thank you for the opportunity yeah, thank you thank, thank you very much thank you we've seen that the questions are coming in the chat so please keep the questions coming uh, we'll have a brief uh, panel discussion now and this will be followed by the q and a session so we have all our speakers here you can see all of them all right so without much ado i will just um, you know all all the presentations were so interesting and i have lots and lots of questions to pose but uh, given the paucity of time i would uh, get myself to asking one question each from each of the panelists and we'll start with the first panelist uh, with ajay and ajay i would just uh, like to hear from you a little bit more on about how the circular economy approach can help in balancing the need for creating a housing stock with the critical need of environmental sustainability so thank you thanks thanks for the question pooja uh, let me you know i i won't talk about using uh, you know junk as i termed in my talk uh we using junk for as a housing building material let's talk about the repurposing of old buildings is it relevant to housing the low income segments of the population i'm sure everyone read about the reverse migration that uh, india had witnessed during the last national lockdown whereby people living in informal settlements and or working in the informal sector decided to walk back travel back to the to their native places and that highlighted the housing and economic vulnerabilities of the informal sector in response i mean everyone it was really a shocker for everyone and the government the national government decided that there needs to be some response from to the challenge and what they decided was to create what was termed as affordable rental housing complexes uh, whereby they would create housing stock which could be rented out to the recent migrants to, to the poor migrants who could not afford a livable housing unit and for the purpose uh, of course given the magnitude of the challenge this was beyond the government to do it itself they decided to engage the private sector also in the endeavor whereby they invited the private sector to create the rental housing stock uh, with whatever incentives were required fiscal as well as non fiscal but what i really liked about the response was the decision to use uh vacant housing units which were created under the earlier national government programs like under the national urban renewal mission the national slum upgrading uh program whereby huge uh, you know housing complexes were created and were never occupied for various reasons and they are they invited the private sector uh, to refurbish these uh housing complexes into affordable rental housing complexes this to me is a prime example of circular approach to refurbishing old buildings uh to meet the housing shortage i hope i answered your question pusha yes no thank you very much it uh, you know it's good to see how something that was there but was not used is actually now being used it's good that they didn't come up with new buildings but actually uh, used the existing infrastructure for that so thank you for that my next question is to vaishali and uh, just to sort of 
take on from where Ajay left off, where we've used what was existing in this emergency situation of COVID-19. But we also know that there is like a fast and an increasing demand for houses. So from your perspective, then how is it possible, especially in the cities, like in, in Delhi, for example, how then can we maintain the green cover in the cities? Because those are critical really to maintain the ecosystem. So Vaishali, please. Thanks, Pooja. And uh, I would, you know, uh, slightly expand that question to also include uh, another aspect, which is more and more becoming critical, which is the urban flooding. Yeah. And both, I would say, the green and the blue. Um, so if we really look at the green and the blue aspects, uh, individual houses, if we say you can, you can look at green walls, this is something that's, you know, really, really come up in in big big way it's very fashionable to have your walls green to have rooftop gardens um when it comes to individual housing when it you know also look at uh, rainwater harvesting you know as individual structures but i would really urge you know all the participants to look at not only at as, as individual but expand the you know because we have these housing you know complexes like ajay was talking about yeah and uh, we have these big big builders who, who build these fancy things, maybe in, in the low-lying area. Yeah. Green, they may not destroy, but definitely if you've destroyed the water, you've destroyed the green around it. And yeah. it's it's important really to look at that you know ecosystem, maybe when you design that building, look at just the watershed where you are looking at native species, you are looking at the water on how to conserve that water channel that maybe runs through that you know to the area that's being developed and uh, just make sure that the channels are not blocked because what we are finding in you know um, more and more and we, we did this work in Bhubaneswar where eventually we are coming up with uh, very simple solutions that there are greens which need to be converted the you know the back as rainwater harvesting areas and uh, uh, there are also um, some some you know paver blocks that can be used which have percolations the other is of course the green part of it which you know is so so there are you know um, uh, each each colony can probably adopt the neighborhood so so but this is more on the larger you know uh, system so you have these uh, these parks that you have uh, within RWAs, and and if the housing, you know, colony looks at it as as an owned owned park, the green can then be sustained with natural species, and you know, so uh, similarly in in commercial areas where where there are various experiments, the only thing is, of course, to put it in a story, you need the city to be there. But if we look at individual, if we look at institutions, if we look at commercial, if we look at, you know, uh, housing, uh, individual or housing complexes, I think it's easy to handle. And if we really look at green roofs and, you know, um, green walls, maybe to start with in denser areas where there is no space, moving on to, you know, a little, little more green that can actually be cultivated. And then, then neighborhood parks, which can be done uh, you know, as uh, you know, in in a uh, with the colony, and and then further and further. So you know, this is something that I would really, uh, you know, we we we've done some work in Coimbatore as well on this, and I think it's well worth. Yeah. No. Oh, thank you, really, so much for highlighting both the green and the blue problem. But then following up from that, a question to Tarun really is also the you know the. Um, need to tackle the sewage uh, problem you know the, the bigger the city grows the more the problem uh, we know related to the to the sewage is so from your perspective what do you think you know how do you envision of the future sort of housing structures which should be there so that the sewage can also be managed and treated well uh, Tarun, please yeah uh, I, I guess uh... We can only look at the future. The past is, uh, right. uh, we can Correct. see the chats, uh, chats happening that this would usually happen. The STP stops working and then they throw more chemicals to fix it and that makes it worse. Right? That's the yeah. system we are in everywhere. If you have lots of money, you can run STP, otherwise you're completely gone. So 
we didn't know how to but future what we suggest is any any new housing structure that comes up you make this stp an eco stp along with the along with the building because there's no moving parts only cement steel labor and sand so when you make a building make the stp co attached biophilic along do the basement or the, uh, along with the uh, entrance so make it part of the thing and then leave it they don't don't and that's what we envision uh, with we done now we're doing around uh, 92 installations from ladakh to kanyakumari to trivandrum mm -hmm. everywhere is like this biophilic along the building do this it could be a um, uh, it could be a temple or it could be a, a, a school for people to be for a low cost uh, school so along school this attached uh, stp so make it all concurrent along with that then make it add on thing which doesn't really work and then add on all these grades that has so make it along with this and do it one time and then make it and treat it more seriously right normally stp is our last thing to uh, you look into it it's not our top priority right and then and then then someone says okay let's put a box and then try to do it and then you that that doesn't work the box doesn't work and you add more chemicals and then more chemicals and uh, the mess uh, you know? so try to make holes and they were making a, sh a small example uh, again as i said now and we also measure the power save so to showcase uh, so now we in our, in our website we show real time the power save we save some 760 megawatts of power small power but 760 megawatts power save because if i don't put a my stp they would have put a motor based stp that much power would have saved so maybe yeah. that also help them when you are saving power doing something good and then make it part of your system being part of your housing unit so all my our this thing is to make sure every new housing unit should have an eco stp or equivalent plugged in right yeah. yes no no thank you so much uh, for that and uh, my last question really would be to Vidya Prakashan. It's very interesting uh, presentation. So we will move now from the urban to the rural areas. Uh, I recall you had mentioned that the cool paint that uh, you know you've come up with the coating is actually affordable um, and consistent in the performance. I mean, is that really the case? Can rural area or people staying in rural areas can they also? you know, afford to buy this and do this on their own. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, actually this one, uh, it will cost just a, a cost of a normal paint. I see. Uh, so it, it is uh, affordable and it anyone can uh, apply. It is just like applying a normal paint and uh, anyone can apply it to DIY. Uh, so it's very easy mm -hmm. to up, easy application. And this contains reflective as well as insulation technology. Normally what happens is only if it is reflective, uh, now due to the pollution and uh, this uh, fine dust settling, uh, they, it loses its reflectivity faster and it tends to fail. So that is where we have come up and researched it and uh, we've uh, fixed it with the insulation technology also with it. So even when there is a dust settling, still there will be a very good uh, result uh, found. And with the help of Habitat, we have uh, given demonstration two, three sites and uh, I'd fed few houses uh, and demonstrated in Chennai. So which uh, we observed temperature between the coated roof and uncoated roof to be around 17 to 18 degrees. And internally, there was a drop in temperature of 3.5 to 4 degrees. So which is huge, uh, which is considerably notable. So even if, uh, if it looks like one or two degrees, three degrees is small, but when it comes to the feeling, it really gives you a lot of uh, difference. And, uh, you know, when you use the fans, like uh, in the nights, they usually you don't have AC in the rural and uh, uh, low housing, low income sector housing. So when they use a fan, uh, still they will be very comfortable in the night. Uh, the, the humidity and the heat wave that you have in the night, it, it will not be there. So it'll be very comfortable and anyone can apply it. And it is consistent to at least uh, to five to seven years minimum. No, thank, thank you, you very much for that. I, I see like we have only 10 minutes left, but there are lots of questions coming. Thank you. Some of uh, our panelists have already answered the questions on the chat, so that, that's going to save us a lot of time. But we would like to take uh, some more um, questions uh, from the floor. And let me see, because the chat is really quite fast, and uh, I will have to go back to have a look. Um, at that. But just uh, one question that came up really at the very beginning, Ajay, when you were speaking was, uh, you gave an example of, um, you know, we are talking about urban areas, but how do we tackle this uh, issue, you know, of housing, you have houses there too. And uh, rural areas are also facing, you know, they are the ones actually who are on the front end of receiving the impacts of climate change. So from your perspective, uh, in a rural setting, how would that work? Uh, you know, how would we tackle that issue? Well, the 
context and challenges in urban and rural areas are quite different or oh, i think in one of the asia pacific housing forum uh, i had also raised this issue that we need to go back to the roots there is you know more and more rural areas are being concretized in the sense modern housing designs are being uh, duplicated in rural areas as well uh, and uh, as the other panelists have mentioned uh, the the concrete structures absorb more heat and radiate more heat as well there is the need to go back to our roots uh, go back to the local building materials which were used the local housing designs which were uh, in abundance in the rural areas to my mind that is the affordable housing option in the rural areas i would have said the same in urban areas in urban areas however however land is a constraint and there is a limit to which we can readopt the traditional houses in urban settings right okay yeah thank you very much for that tarun there have been similar questions uh, so i'll just pull out one and i'll try to aggregate it i mean the uh, there's a lot of interest in the eco stp but people are asking questions on how can this be scaled up i mean how how do you see is there a lot of scope for scaling this up or what has been your experience so far is there a lot of interest um in this technology that you are promoting yeah we are slowly making a uh, making a like we're disrupting because i said 99.99% is motor based stp so when you try something uh, it'll be uh, difficult but we are making a difference we have uh, as i said uh, 92 installations all over india going on and uh, 30 40 are gone live and we have happy customers talking about us so slowly we are making a wave uh, mm -hmm. and and educating uh, people that uh, you don't need any good old techniques works you don't need any radically new technology to move the move the face so slowly that moment is happening yeah. uh, so speak yeah so slowly yeah. yeah yeah thank you for that and this is a question i think i will i can pose this both to vaishali as well as to ajay because you you know you both spoken about a uh, circular economy which is very important but there there are questions similar in nature which are talking about reusing the building material or you know or looking for more innovative solutions or more sustainable materials for housing construction so from your perspective i would say are both equally important or what is more important uh, vaishali i'll let you have a go first because i already posed the question to ajay sorry i'm looking at the question at the same time vaishali yes. so yes please so um so not only the material but the circularity yeah mm -hmm. i would say yeah. both both are important uh, mm -hmm. also the innovation so somehow i feel that we are you know um, in the housing sector kind of stuck uh sorry to sound like that but this is my feeling sometimes as an outsider uh i am a geographer by profession so i consider myself a non architect so um, so from that perspective i really feel that sometimes the housing sector has kind of got stuck and uh, a very innovative uh, methodology that we used uh, especially in india i would say yeah so the stuck part is i would say in india um and we really need like ajay was saying to look back at our roots uh sometimes we are trying to ape what is there in the west while we already experimented with certain kind of systems uh and had had been on top of our you know of our game so uh, there was really no waste if it came out from an old house yeah there was lime and mortar and brick and you know so so brick was not really there i i still have one of our uh, several of our ancestral houses which is lime and mortar yeah uh, but uh, which went that it was totally eco friendly there was really you know nothing that was coming out uh, what we are then now shifting to looking at you know various kinds of um, Uh, rating systems yeah in order to achieve lead rating you need to have a centralized ac why you know why look at a centralized system so this is some this is a struggle that i am having in in the eco in the kochi municipal corporation building where the municipal corporation saying we don't have the money but the leads you know uh, system says you really need that so 
how is it that we can we can improvise we can we can look at a system we of course you know figured it out that there are there are ways to look at look at basic normal systems without low cost where you really don't need ac systems so but but my my thing what i'm trying to say is don't look at the west don't ape it at least when it comes to india uh, it i think we really need to look at innovation there are lots of things that are available that really need to be adapted uh, what fits in the north does not fit in the south and uh, east or west so it's it has to be local it has to be your state specific uh, maybe use design thinking methodologies industry is very good at it uh, maybe you know architects we really need to go back and look at our drawing boards make it simple make it cheap make it affordable and make it green that is all that i can say yeah no thank you so much for that and one last question we actually running out of time we have to wind up the session is uh, for mr vidya prakash and that's essentially um, you know are you are there also other products that you manufacture which you know are climate friendly uh, the, you had already explained the ones you do there there is interest in people are also like where can we access it i'm getting it in a yes separate message some on my phone but somebody just also asked how you know if we need if we need that product then do they just need to go to your website to get the information is that the right way to go go about it we can't hear you sorry you're on mute please uh, so yeah in the website all the details of our products are there and uh, most of the products are green certified and based on uh, energy saving and uh, some products are based on self cleaning which reduces the maintenance so everything is based on um, reducing something <laughs> so either the energy or uh, reducing the maintenance cost or reduce reduction of use of chemicals for cleaning so something is related to the uh, reduce reduction of chemicals and reduction of uh, power on these things uh, we use uh, this cool roof coating also comes in form of tiles as well which is a permanent solution uh, mm -hmm. for a building so it comes in tile form and uh, we have the glass coating which is majorly for the glass buildings and even houses are now very much interested in going for it because the west side they get uh, even in their houses insulated still to the glass they get a lot of heat uh, coming inside when there was sunshine uh, when falls into the house directly so mm -hmm. these are few uh, solutions we have and we have some nano coatings for self cleaning which is for uh, less maintenance coatings yeah no thank you for that we are almost out of time so i would like to take this opportunity really once again to thank all our esteemed panelists and also our keynote speaker hope um, you know this panel and the discussions here were able to provide our audience with a lot of ideas a lot of food for thought so we still have a long way to go and the housing sector really um, can or is already impacting uh, climate change in a big way so we really need to look for innovative solutions to how to tackle it not only well i would say innovation is very important but also retrofitting as ajay had emphasized is also very important so we should look for all these different kind of solutions to really uh, work together mm -hmm. with and to come up with a solution which is uh, usable and adaptable um, at different levels and also in the urban setting as well as in the rural setting so with this once again thank you everybody for your participation thank you our panelists and our keynote speakers i this is in case you have any more questions for our panelists or if you would need more information or require more information please feel free to write to me and uh, if it's a question to a specific panelist please kindly let me know who the question is for and i will forward your uh, query to them so Thank you once again. And with this, uh, I would like to close this panel. Everybody stay safe and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.